Aloha, everyone, and thank you so much for tuning in for another week of Trauma Recovery University. I am your host, Athena Moberg, and with us in the green room is your incredible co-host and my esteemed colleague, Bobby Parrish. We are so excited that you've joined us here this evening for live Q&A Mondays. If you're not familiar with our broadcast, we come here every single week and we do a live Q&A sort of online interactive talk show for adult survivors of childhood abuse, specifically childhood sexual abuse. We receive your questions and interact with you on Twitter using the hashtag no more shame. And this is one of three Twitter chats that we participate in and help facilitate every single week for adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse. So welcome, welcome. If this is your first time viewing one of our videos, we are going to dive right into content pretty soon here. We do want to welcome everyone that has been hanging out and, and, and asking questions. We would love to answer your questions. We monitor the hashtag, no more shame, usually seven days a week, and we try to get back with you, and we usually answer your questions every Monday, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. So what is this week's topic? We have a different topic every week. Last week we talked about intrusive thoughts. You can look at our entire library of topics over on traumarecoveryuniversity.com or nomoreshameproject.com. Click on the tab that says downloadables and you'll get complimentary access to our entire library of downloadable PDF resources. One of them matches up with each and every episode this week. This week we're going to answer your questions regarding the topic of cognitive distortions. What are cognitive distortions? What does that look like in the life of an adult survivor of childhood abuse? How did they uh, play out in our childhood? How do they show up in our adulthood? We are going to unpack all of this, answer all of your questions, and um, hopefully be able to interact with you and spend some time with you this evening. We appreciate each and every one of you. Our YouTube channel is growing. Our Roku TV channel is growing. If you're tuning in on a podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Spreaker, SoundCloud, iHeartRadio, we love you guys. We're so grateful for you. Check out our YouTube or our Roku TV channel whenever you get the opportunity, as this is always a video broadcast. And we love being able to see you and have you sort of see us and be able to interact. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Bobby. We're going to issue a trigger warning for those of you who are trauma survivors. And take it away, Bobby. Hi, everybody. Um, I do want to issue a trigger warning for tonight's uh, video broadcast and audio broadcast. We are discussing, dis discussing, woo, discussing childhood abuse. And specifically, sometimes we will discuss childhood sexual abuse. So if you're listening or watching, it can be triggering. And if you're watching us live right now and you're triggered, just go ahead and turn it off and put it away and come back later. Um, things will upload to YouTube within a matter of a couple of hours. You can come back at any time and continue to watch. If you are watching or listening to a replay of one of our episodes and you're triggered, just go ahead and turn it off. Again, you can come back at any time. If you're triggered, right now or you're in crisis we would encourage you to reach out to friends at rain that's the rape abuse incest national network they are available uh, toll free in canada or the united states at 1-800-656-HOPE h-o-p-e they also have a worldwide crisis chat feature on their website and that is r-a-i-n-n.org if you're in the UK, you can contact the Samaritans. Um, they have a toll-free crisis hotline, and they are also available via email. You can email joe 
at Samaritans.org. Joe, that's J-O. Um, you can go to their website at any time, Samaritans.org, and get information on how to connect with them. They also have some local offices in the UK, and you can stop by and see someone in person. So we really encourage you to take advantage of those resources if you're in crisis. If you are in crisis tonight and you've come to try and connect with one of our community members to get support, we ask that you please to do so off of the Twitter stream. Because when you're in crisis and you're talking about really hard and difficult things, it can trigger um, other community members who have come here to listen to the broadcast, to ask questions, and to get information. You're important to us. If you're in crisis, we want you to reach out to Rain, or to reach out to the Samaritans, or reach out to one of our other community members. Just don't use the hashtag no more shame. Just tag someone directly. We have a growing community in Australia, and we're currently crowdsourcing for good um, crisis resource hotlines and websites in Australia. I learned this week that the um, the emergency number in Australia is 000, whereas here in the US it's 911. Um, so pretty soon, hopefully by next broadcast, we will have some crisis resources for our growing community down in New Zealand and Australia. Thank you so much for doing that, Bobby. I just wanted, I, I, I was reaching out last week wondering because we have several survivors in our community that really needed some crisis support. But um, Simi has asked us if this is take two since our first live stream tonight, something was wrong with our, with our tech and it looks like everybody is still, we see people now, so that's good. But she asked us if we would say boo. So boo. <laughs> uh, Yes, this is take two, and the other the other video, which was 30 minutes long or whatever, um, we're going to delete it because it is redundant, and we would rather hang out here with you live and answer your questions. So um, thank you for hanging in there with us, you guys. You guys are the greatest community ever, seriously. Like, who else do you know, Bobby, if they're, like, sitting around for 20 or 30 minutes, like, looking, trying to figure out what's going on, and and they're like... Oh, well, that's okay. We'll just start over from the beginning and they'll just hang out for 30 minutes, like just waiting for us. I just feel so blessed, you guys. And um, <laughs> you guys are just awesome. And you make the frustrating parts of the work we do funny and enjoyable tolerable. and tolerable <laughs> and tolerable. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, <laughs> This week's topic, Bobby, when we were doing chat, um, when we were doing chat this morning, this is one of three Twitter chats that we do every single week for adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse. And if you didn't catch this morning, which is hashtag CSAQT, which stands for child sex, childhood sexual abuse question time, that is at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern. Um, it was quite the lively chat. And Brenda Ewan, as always, just such a rock star. Um, but quite the, um, quite the informative and interactive and supportive chat, and it was really neat to see everyone coming alongside one another and discussing the different types of cognitive distortions that affected their childhood and that has bled into their adulthood and how they're sort of coping with that. Uh, lots of banter back and forth, real encouraging words and um, replacing of those old wrong thoughts. So um, what are your thoughts and your comments about this morning's chat, Bobby? I was so encouraged by everyone's interaction. Yes. You know, one of these things that is just so magical, and I know that people might think that's an inappropriate word, but truly, it is magical to come to these chats and to watch people go, oh my gosh, I thought I was the only one who thought that way. I thought I was the only one who dealt with that particular thought. Um, I felt so alone, but look at you guys are all here, and um, I don't feel so alone now, and it is the most amazing thing in the world. And yes, Athena and I do get in there, and we do steer things, um, but you guys are what makes the magic. So we are so thankful for you, and this morning was wonderful to see people, to see those light bulbs go off and people to go, oh my gosh, I had no idea that that's where that thought process came from. And now that I know where it comes from, I can do something about it. 
um, and that is so true. And uh, I also want to point out, uh, now, you guys get this, my lovely set um, every week is, is pretty much stays the same. But y'all have to notice where Miss Athena is today and her lovely backdrop. And I'll be quiet so she can talk so you can see it. Bobby, you're so sweet. Um, thank you for doing that. <laughs> She um, worked hours, hours and hours, people. And on, days, days. Yes, days and days redoing her office. Um, it is beautiful. Both her husband and I told her it looks like heaven. So um, we must be right. And <laughs> she also gave us lovely backdrops for Christmas. So um, Athena is hereby crowned with the queen of lovely backdrops for um, podcasts and Google Hangouts. Thank you so much. I have like a little tiny bit of a backstory that is on topic for this week, um, cognitive distortions. And it has something to do with the environment that I'm in here in my office right now. So I just want to real quick, I didn't tell you about this off the air, Bobby, so I hope it's okay that I'm just jumping right in. Um, is that all right? Yes, absolutely. Jump, jump. Okay, jump, jump. So one of the cognitive distortions and the wrong thinking that was sort of uh, shoved down my throat, if you will, um, in my developmental years, is that I wasn't really good at anything or I didn't have any freedom to live or breathe or do anything. Um, it was very much my reality at the time. I didn't have a lot of freedom. Uh, as many of you know, I was forced to carry a little bag of horse manure to school with me to put my hands in because my appearance had to be perfect and part of my appearance was my fingernails and as you can see, I'm a fingernail biter. Uh, so, um, And I was not allowed to cut my own hair, which is why I nearly got choked to death by one of my abusers. Um, I had no freedom. I had no human freedom. I wasn't allowed to use the restroom on my own without someone yelling through the door or timing me. Um, or saying, what's that smell? What are you doing in there? I wasn't allowed to shower on my own um, without disgusting men wanting to watch me shower and, and make me do things with other people. And um, I had no freedom. I didn't, um, it may sound very um, melodramatic, which is another thing I was told uh, growing up by one of my abusers is that I'm so melodramatic. Um, I'm here to tell you that I'm, that I'm very real and that I'm not being melodramatic right now, I could definitely flower this up for you and make it melodrama, but I'm just going to tell it to you like, like it is. Um, I didn't have freedom because I was living in an abusive environment where there was a lot of police activity, and the words I was told and the, the way I viewed myself and viewed the world um, and viewed my surroundings, including my bedroom, um, I viewed them with great fear and trembling, and it, it was a place of horror. My bedroom was never a place of peace and tranquility, um, productivity. I wasn't allowed to decorate the way I wanted to decorate. I would get in trouble for putting thumbtacks in the wall um, to hang up posters, heaven forbid. Um, tape was going to ruin the paint, so that was out of the question. I, I once made a pillow fort in my room, and I got in trouble for that, like with blankets and stuff. Um, so I, I at the beginning of the year chose to take some time off and away from my computer. Um, I got my writing deadlines out of the way. I recorded some videos. I did the work that I needed to do, but I chose to take a few full days off and I wanted to create a space that I was proud of, that I felt safe in, something that I, my little girl had never had. And so this room um, that I'm sitting in right now it used to be an office that matched the rest of the house, and it was very dark, dark wood. Everything was dark, 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 um, and and it was very cluttered. And I just didn't it didn't feel like mine ever. Um, my husband wanted me to have it feel like mine, but it just didn't really work, or it didn't really help because of because of the intrusive thoughts that I was living with, because of the cognitive distortions of my childhood. So in order for me to battle and counteract those those cognitive distortions, I wrote myself notes that I'm, I'm capable and that I do know how to paint and that I am going to have a safe environment and I can turn this room into anything I want it to be and it is going to be a safe place and I am going to enjoy my time in there and I'm going to make it pretty and feminine. And I don't know if you all can see, 
but I have these little twinkly lights everywhere all around the perimeter of my room. Okay. Yay! Um, I have, I, I, it took me days to hang. The, there are 400 little lights hanging from the walls. And it took me days and days and days just to paint um, the walls. And I bought a rug because it was light and bright and, and, and flowy and beautiful and just all of it, you guys. And I did this. I did this for me. I did this for the little girl that I was that never, ever, ever had a pretty, beautiful, safe, awesome room. And I have to tell you that it is one of the greatest acts of self-care I've ever spearheaded and sort of did for, done for myself. It was one of the very biggest tasks I've ever taken on, ever taken on a task this large before. I, I've challenged myself physically. I lifted furniture. I painted every piece of furniture in this room myself. It used to all be dark. And I painted it all white, all of it. So um, anyway, you guys, it is possible to counteract these cognitive distortions. When I viewed the world like I can't do anything, I'm not ever going to be safe. I'm always going to be a visitor in my own home. I'm never going to have so uh, something that I can be proud of. I counteracted that and I took action. And I'm not saying that you all have money to go to Ace Hardware and buy some spray paint and spray your furniture because that costs money. Yes, it costs money for me to do this, but I saved up. I spent my birthday money and my Christmas money and I saved it up and I took it down and I bought white paint for everything and I bought paint for my walls and sparkly lights and, and I'm happy and I am battling those intrusive thoughts. I'm, I'm, I'm countering those cognitive distortions and I am going to walk my talk if it kills me. If I'm going to sit here and tell you all that this is something you should try, then I need to make sure that I know how to do it. So I'm doing it. And it's like emotional. And I just sit, I sat here eating oatmeal the other morning going, oh my gosh, I actually did it. Wow. <laughs> and it, it's so, it's so neat. And it's that little girl in me going, I, I mean, I laid on the, on the floor, just looking up at these sparkly lights for like an hour going, I'm really safe in here. This is my space. This is my, this is my spot in the home and, and I'm safe here and this is mine. So I'm going to start crying now, <laughs> but, um, it's just, it was a really big deal. You guys really, really big, big deal. deal. It is a big deal because you took the power and you empowered yourself and you made something nice for yourself. And I think like I said before, I'm bad at multitasking here, tweeting and talking at the same time. It's the perfect analogy for what actually happens inside our heads as we recover, right? Because we grow up, most of us, you know, some of us had isolated incidents of sexual abuse or abuse, or we were sexually abused by someone outside of our family. But most of us were abused by a family member, or we were abused by someone outside our family member, and yet we still had a very dysfunctional <coughs> family system. And so we grew up in a world filled with cognitive distortions. We didn't know what healthy thinking was. We didn't know what healthy beliefs were. Um, we didn't know what it was like to see the world through a healthy lens. We saw it through the distorted lens of our parents and our primary caregivers, our abuser. And when you don't know anything differently, that's all you see until you grow up you separate from your family and you start to see that there's something different and you know you want that, but you're not quite sure how to get there. And so that's the analogy of what Athena did. She cleared out all the stuff that didn't make her happy, that didn't support her, and she made something that is beautiful, that supports her, that empowers her, that inspires her, and allows her to reach new, healthier levels in her life. And that's exactly what we have to do as survivors. And this morning in chat, and people were talking about, I didn't even know what a cognitive distortion was. I don't know how to get rid of them. It's so overwhelming. I don't know how to start. Um, that's like standing in the middle of the room that you never had a chance to design or to decorate. It's ugly. It's dark. It's depressing. Every time you used to touch something, someone would scream at you. You're doing it wrong. Don't touch that. 
okay, now we have a chance to change that and to make something different for ourselves. And yes, it is scary and it is hard. It's not an overnight process. And learning to think healthy ways is frightening because we've never been there before. We don't know if it's gonna look like what we think it's gonna look like. Athena had a vision in her head for what she thought she, the room would look like. But she didn't know that it would actually end up like that. She didn't know if she was capable of making it end up looking like the vision she had in her head. I almost wasn't. Say, I almost wasn't. I, I literally collapsed from physical exhaustion because I was trying to paint walls that were 10 feet high and I'm only five foot four. But see, that's, that's so perfect. That's such a perfect analogy. It is hard. It is hard to rewire our brains. And it requires us to go to heights that we've never been to before. And it requires us to exercise muscles we've never exercised before. Um, but it's possible. Okay. And it may have, it may take us a while. And we may need more support than we thought we would. And it may not turn out exactly like we thought it would be. It might turn out much better. So we're going to talk about cognitive distortions tonight. We're going to pull up the one page and look at the content that we've put together. First, we're going to talk about what exactly cognitive distortions are. And then we're going to talk about what do you do about them? How do you get rid of them? How do you learn to think in a more healthy process? How do you learn to replace those negative beliefs with healthy ones? And um, we're going to kind of give you a shove down the path so that you can um, make your own room with whatever color paint you want and lights however you want and furniture however you want and um, a spirit that empowers you and supports you um, to make things even more beautiful. So I think that's a perfect analogy and you get to pick your own colors too. Gosh Thank darn it. Thank you so much, Bobby. Thank <laughs> you. It was so hard. You guys, just like our recovery, I have to tell you that it was really, really hard and my entire house was, my this room was gutted. So my whole house had pieces of furniture everywhere and boxes and things and plastic packages that lights came in and everything smelt like paint and it was so gross for like weeks and like because it was all I was prepping you know pre prepping so that I could take that few days to just really really dive into it but it's just like our recovery like Bobby said thank you so much for agreeing Bobby and saying that it's like a good analogy because you know my whole house smelled and my husband was really patient with me I, w I was terrified the whole time that he was going to be mad at me. I kept apologizing that my stuff was everywhere. And he's like, no, like, it's a, it's a work in progress. We're all a work in progress. And I was just like, oh, I love that man. Like, wow. <laughs> you know, like, I, I just, it was, it's not easy, you guys. Recovery is not easy. Demolition on a room in your home isn't easy. No, nothing that, it, that, uh, requires overhauling something it's never easy that's why it's called an overhaul because it, it's it's just it's work it's hard and it's not pretty it's not I mean it's not the finished product it's a work in progress and I am willing to admit that my recovery journey from my childhood abuse is a work in progress and I'm gonna be a work in progress for quite some time and my cognitive distortions they show up when I don't want them to, and I am gaining the tools I need to, to counteract them and to see them, stop them, and change them. And that's what Bobby and I are so passionate about. We always want to give you tools to see where growth needs to happen, stop the bad, and change it to something good. And that's what this whole broadcast, this whole project that started whenever it started couple years ago that's what this whole project is about we want you to be able to see it stop it and change it and not be left to wonder if the mental health system or the system in general is gonna you know finally deliver what they say they're gonna or finally help you to feel better or if that one medication is gonna work or if that one therapist is gonna be great or whatever you know it's it's a combination and a, and a culmination of so many different pieces and it's not pretty 
but you can do it. If I can do it, you can do it. If Bobby can do it, you can do it. We are here with you. So, yeah. Yes. And, you know, I don't know if everybody has one of these, but my entire life I've always had a junk drawer in my kitchen. And it's just kind of that catch-all drawer that, you know, everything gets thrown into, this one spare battery, the the one spare this that you have. And, you know, yeah. sometimes it's just like I have no place else to shove that it's going in here. Um, uh-huh. Because you don't want it know, on Like, yeah. why not just put it in that little drawer? Yeah. Right. And, uh, I mean, I've had one since I was a kid. We had a junk drawer in the kitchen. It's always in the kitchen. Junk drawer in the kitchen. Um, and... You know, sometimes recovery is just about taking that drawer and upending it and going, okay, some of this is just junk and I need to get rid of it. Some of it I need to keep. And so you decide what you want to keep. You decide what you need to get rid of. And you get to decide what you need to still procure that you can add to it. So um, it isn't easy. It's not easy. And um, Athena and I have been at this for probably a good 30 years between the two of us, if not more. And we're here to tell you it's not easy. And if someone tells you it's easy or a therapist or provider is telling you you should just hop to it and fix it right now um, or a family member or a friend, um, then they really don't know what they're talking about. So we want to give you the tools to change and to feel better now, but we also want to give you the understanding and the support and the grace um, to be in it for the long haul. So um, let's pull up the one page. Is that okay, Athena? Are we? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have myself a job, Bobby. A um, job? Yeah, I you got a have job. A job. Just, you have like two hour, two jobs. I do. I have, <laughs> I have too many jobs, but I just got another job. Sarah is going to hire me to come and redecorate her place for her. And so... I'm headed to the UK, everybody, so I'm going to come back talking like this and saying things like cheerio, and I'm going to be having tea, and I'm very excited, and I'm going to be having cookies, and... No, 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 you're going to have oh, biscuits. biscuits. Biscuits, not cookies. They're biscuits. That's and right. Yes, so, yes, yes, I just got myself a job. Okay, you can put up the one page now. Sorry, everybody. Okay. <laughs> Okay, wait. Share, present to everyone. Yay! It Almost yay. Beautiful. It looks beautiful. Uh, wait, there. There. That yay. Oh, nope. Sorry. Wrong yay. No, it there. looks awesome. Okay. It looks awesome. Oh. It looks great. Okay. So cognitive distortions. Cognitive distortions are incorrect ways of processing information that lead to negative thinking, perceptions, and beliefs. Okay, an example of a cognitive distortion is once I fail at something, I will never be successful at it again. Okay, so for like, you know, when I was a kid, I just, PE was my nemesis. Okay, and we used to play perpetually, we used to play dodgeball. I swear it was the only thing that we ever did in PE when I was a kid. And I learned that since I wasn't good at it when I first started playing, that I would never be good. And that's a cognitive distortion that leads to negative thinking. Just because you fail at something once or at the beginning when you try it, or not even use the word fail, just because I struggle with it or I'm not good at it, doesn't mean that I will never be good at it. It just means that I need to learn. And I need some help, okay? But that cognitive distortion that says once I fail at something, I will never be successful at it again, leads to negative thinking. So I says, why should I even try? I'll always fail. And then it leads to that negative belief of I'm a failure, okay? So the distortion is once I fail at something, I'll never be successful again. The thinking is, why should I even try? I'll always fail. And the belief is, I'm a failure as a person. So anyone can have cognitive distortions. In fact, I mean, you can look them up on the website. There are a um, dealing with cognitive distortions is a, what's the word I want? A cornerstone in the process of cognitive behavioral therapy. 
Yeah. Okay. So Richard, Richard yeah. Grannon talks a lot about CBT. Yes. Or no. And he, yeah. No, he does. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, it is a cornerstone piece of a foundational piece in CBT. And so people who have depression, anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, um, anyone can have cognitive distortions. They are not unique to us as survivors. But because we were raised by and in regular contact with our abusers and our enablers during our childhood, and they used a myriad of cognitive distortions to justify their behavior, we grew up being taught that those ways of thinking were the truth. Okay, so it's a little bit like this morning in chat, someone, and I can't remember who first threw it out, um, brought up the analogy of being raised in toxic soup. And it is oh very gosh, much like that. So, you know, awesome of a description. Because we grew up steeped, soaked in that, in those cognitive distortions. And our abusers and our enablers, they used cognitive distortions to justify their behavior. They used those to keep us quiet and keep us silent. Um, their enablers used them to silence us and keep us quiet. And so we grew up, cognitive distortions became our standard way of thinking and became ingrained in us in a very young age. We never knew there was another way of perceiving ourselves and the world around us except through the lens of cognitive distortion. And I don't know if they have them very much anymore, whether it's just something that's particular to um, my generation and older, but do they still have those funhouse mirrors? Out yeah, there? They, like on, at the county fair, they do. Right, like, right, where you go in fair. and, yeah, and you can stand in one and it makes you like really short and fat or makes you like, you know, really tall. Yes, um, yes. It's like, it's like having been raised in a house where there were no true mirrors. Every mirror was a fun house mirror. And so you never saw yourself for who you really were. You saw it through the lens of cognitive distortion. And so you grow up. That's a great analogy. With this being your way of thinking. And you get out in the world and you can't figure out how in the world other people are having healthy relationships and good things are happening and they're they're strong and they're self-confident. And it's like, well, how in the world are y'all doing that? I don't know how to do that. Until you can take a look at what's going on inside your head and realize that you were raised in a fun house full of mirrors, which was not a fun house. Um, it was probably more like a house of horrors filled with, you know, cognitive distortion mirrors once yeah. you figure that out then you can change it and you can find accurate mirrors so let's talk about some different kinds of cognitive distortions um, I found so many lists online and I picked the ones that are most common that I have heard in um, my several decades of working with survivors okay the first one is called filtering and that's when we have an experience, but we filter out anything positive, and the only thing we take away from that experience is are the negative things. Mm -hmm. And then we blow them up. Okay? So say, for example, we have a birthday party, and we're hosting it for our friend. And things, some things go wrong. Okay, the, the punch gets spilled all over the carpet, um, the air conditioning's not working right, so people are hot, and the cake eh, didn't quite come out the way we wanted it to. We walk away from that experience, and our mind completely obliterates all the positive things. We, we block out the fact that our friend had an incredible time. We block out the fact that we got her a present that she just adored so much she burst into tears. We filter all those things out and we walk away going, I am the worst party hostess in the entire world. I'm a failure and I, I'm never going to try that again. I'm never going to do it again. Because we have that filter 
that filter of cognitive distortion that we see allows us to see only the negative and not the positive. I have some questions from our Twitter feed, Bobby. Okay, hit me. Okay, I'm going to just rapid fire them to you and then we can sort of do a wrap up. Is that okay? Absolutely. Okay, okay, good. Um, so Grace Hope says a therapist said that she didn't know why I wanted to be stuck in this place. Like she's stuck right now and her therapist said that she didn't understand why she wanted to be stuck. Ooh, my mama bear inside is just going nuts right now. That is such a wrong thing to say. Kate says, so wait, are cognitive distortions learned behaviors or is it something we're just born with? And then um, I also have uh, Grace, Grace also wants to know what is the difference between an intrusive thought and a core belief and how and, and, and I want to sort of maybe talk about how that plays into cognitive distortions because they all sort of go together. And Simi wants to know is it possible to have cognitive distortions if you haven't been abused throughout your life? Yes, because everybody gets them. And then Kalisha um, says cognitive distortion seems like it can be manipulative behavior. That's quite the insight. Uh, Bobby just used funhouse mirrors to explain cognitive distortions, and for some reason it makes sense now. <laughs> um, and then August wants to know, is cognitive distortions the same as schema? So there is your rapid fire cue, and Bobby is going to give you some A's. <laughs> um, August, schema, cognitive distortions, yes, can be very much the same. Um, kind of a different, two different psychological schools of thought coming at it from two, di two different directions, but they're ending up pretty much in the same place. So yes. Um, and yes, you can have cognitive distortions even if you were not abused as a child. If your family system was dysfunctional, um, not to the point of being abusive, but just dysfunctional, then you can have cognitive distortions. If you grow up um, and you end up in an unhealthy relationship, an abusive relationship with an abusive partner, you can develop uh, cognitive distortions. So they don't come only from abuse. And sometimes they'll develop um, as a part and parcel of depression. Remember, you guys, depression messes with our heads. It messes with our brain chemistry. Depression and, is a liar. Yes. What about, what about this? Uh, what about Kalisha um, mentioning that cognitive distortions seem like they can be manipulative behavior? They're very manipulative. Absolutely. And our abusers, enablers used them to manipulate us into being quiet, into believing that was hap what was happening to us was right or that it was wrong, but we deserved it. Yep. Um, it you you yes. asked for it. You asked That's right. for it. I'm going to give you something to cry about. Um, yeah. And then what's the difference between intrusive thoughts and a core belief? And then I want to tie that into cognitive distortions. Okay. Um, a core belief is a statement about yourself, who you are. And an intrusive thought can be, a core belief can be a type of intrusive thought. But remember, an intrusive thought is a repetitive belief that cycles through your head over and over and over again, and you feel like you can't stop it. So a core belief can be an intrusive thought, but intrusive thoughts in and of themselves are not core beliefs. Does that make sense? It's yeah. like um, saying that, I'm trying to think of an analogy because I'm so analogy driven, um, and I can't think of one right now. I hope that helps. So, I mean, if that doesn't help, um, um, that's for great. That's for Grace Hope. And then, okay, how, hit how, us back. how can we tie that in with cognitive distortions? What? Uh, <laughs> you like, lost so, me? Well, like there, there's the three different pieces to the puzzle here. There's the core belief. There's the right. intrusive thoughts, and then there's the cognitive distortions. Okay. And I can see them all as a part of one big happy dysfunctional family. And, and they can be, absolutely. Um, an intrusive thought can be a core belief, but an intrusive thought is something that wraps through your head repetitively that you feel like you don't have any control of. It can be a thought. It can be an action statement, like I want to go into the kitchen and stab my eyes out. 
It can be a um, slideshow of memories from our childhood. Cognitive distortion is the very foundation of our, it's like your, your worldview, your view of the world and yourself is a foundation, okay, like a foundation under a building. And it has three parts. One of them is your negative thinking. One of them is um, negative beliefs. And then um, another part of that can be how they feed into intrusive thoughts. Does that does that help at all? Yes. Athena? Yes, okay. it helps me. I, I I see the picture clearly, and I just wanted I wanted us to address it out loud like that. But Grace, hope let us know if that helps you, or if you need more of a of us more of a pulling apart of that. Okay. So let's go back and talk about some other different kinds of cognitive distortions. And maybe Grace Hope, this will help um, as we code through these different things and you recognize some of them, perhaps it will help. Another one is black or black and white thinking. Again, thinking in extremes. Um, something is either all good or it's all bad. It's always good or it's always bad. There's no in between, there's no middle. And this is partic this is something that is particularly susceptible for survivors because we grow up in extremes. We grow up in extremes of horror and terror. Um, if we're in a domestic violence situations, that's extremes. And so we tend up to grow up believing and thinking and processing in extremes. Next type, overgeneralizations. Believing that if something is true in one situation, that it is always going to be true. Okay, so if um, we're in high school and we have a crush on that popular guy, okay, for whatever reason, he's the, you know, the cat's pajamas for every girl in the high school and he doesn't give us the time of day, doesn't see us, doesn't know our name. If we fell off the face of the earth, he would never notice it. An overgeneralization would be no popular guy is ever going to like me, which of course is not true. It, that one particular guy didn't notice you, but that doesn't mean that every popular guy, man for the rest of your life is never going to notice you or like you. Um, catastrophizing. This is thinking the worst case scenario will always happen. Okay, so um, something like this would be, um, oh my gosh, I missed my bus. I missed my bus. That means that I'm going to be late for my appointment. Um, my boss is going to fire me. I'm going to end up living homeless on the street and um, my life will be ruined and I'll die on a cardboard box in the middle of the night freezing to death. Yes. Okay. Bobby, do you remember that that class that I took, uh, the continuing education units class? That yes. I took uh -huh. Several months back on on um, what it was the certification I received on core belief restructuring. There you go. So, yes. So to to add to this, this is what I was trying to think of when Grace Hope asked the question. So as part of the core belief restructuring process, we tackled cognitive distortions and replaced wrong thinking with right thinking. Yes. And I hope that helps Grace Hope. I hope that gives you a little bit of a visual like like a bit like during part of the, the class, Bobby, remember I told you about how there were the, the pile of rocks right. and each of those rocks represented shame, something we were deeply, deeply ashamed of and that we attached to our self-worth. A core belief is something you believe that about yourself deep down, like, and, it, and, and it is, it's how you identify your worthiness to even be like alive or in relationship with other people. Whereas right. co cognitive distortions are messages that were, that were taught to us, whether they're verbally or non-verbally, in the midst of dysfunction. Right. So I hope that the, I hope this helps you guys. If you need more info, um, tweet us at No More Shame. So hashtag No More Shame. Oh, she says yes, it helps. Yay! Thank okay. you, Grace Hope. Oh my gosh, I feel so much better now. <laughs> I'm, I just wanted to make sure we helped her. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, we want everyone to walk away feeling like they have a handle on the topic and they can tackle it in their lives. 
I'm happy dancing. Um, Yay. <laughs> <laughs> the, the next one is jumping to conclusions, okay, which is presuming an end result based upon flawed thinking, okay? So I go to work one day, and okay, no, I go to a social function, and I'm wearing um, an outfit that I absolutely adore, and someone who I um, respect and admire is there, and she's freely giving out compliments, but she doesn't give one to me. And I presume that that means that she didn't like what I was wearing and she didn't like me. But the reality is that maybe she just didn't even see me. Um, maybe she was so focused on something else that I didn't even pass in front of her line of sight. But we jump to the conclusion based on flawed thinking, okay? Because thinking that she saw us, didn't like what we were wearing, don't didn't like us, that's flawed thinking. We don't know that. We have nothing to base that reality on. Um, but we jump to that conclusion in our head. This next one is control fallacies. Believing that our feelings or other people are in control of us. Um, when we are young, we really don't have a lot of power. We just don't. Um, you know, Athena described earlier in the broadcast her situation when she was younger. The reality is she did not have any power. She didn't have any control. I didn't have any control during my childhood. But as we grow into adults, we do have power. And the control fallacy is that we do not. Okay? So maybe we need to change something in our life. We need to think about something differently. We need to act in a different way that is more healthy. And the lie that our abuse told us is, no, I can't do that. I don't have the power to do that. I can't quit drinking. I can't um, quit um, binging on dozens of cookies when I feel so badly. Um, I can't do that. I can't. I can't. I can't. You hear a lot of I can't when people have the false belief that they don't have any control. Um, and the reality is that that's a lie. We do have control. Is it easy? Are we saying it's easy? Nope. But you do have power and you do have control. And the next one is the horrible shoulds. Um, and so many of us struggle with this one. We have a list of ironclad, unyielding rules for how we need to behave, think, and feel. Um, this was something that my therapist and I used to go round and round and round and round and round in circles about because I had double standards. Was it okay for someone else to be late for a meeting because um, their car broke down on the freeway? Of course, of course it was. Is it okay for me? Nope. Um, was it okay for someone else to call in sick to work because they weren't feeling well? Well, of course it was. I mean, you know, that person's sick. They need to stay home. Is it okay for me? Nope. Not okay. Falls outside that realm of what's acceptable. And the rules are unyielding and ironclad. And if I break them, I'm a horrible, bad, terrible, 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 terrible person who deserves no love or anything good for the rest of their life, which just wrapped in so many of those cognitive distortions. And the last one is emotional reasoning. And we talked about this one a little bit last week when we talked about intrusive thoughts. Okay? When we are thinking, um, I feel terrible. I feel terrible. I feel terrible. The cognitive distortion in our mind becomes, I am terrible. Okay? Um, I feel badly, therefore, I am bad. But that's not true. Those are just feelings. Those are just emotions. They don't define us. Um, and we need to be able to say inside our head, okay, I feel badly today, but I'm not bad. Um, I feel feel worthless today, but I am not worthless, okay? Our emotions, our feelings, even our thoughts and our beliefs don't define us. 
um, that's a whole different ball of wax. So I'm hoping that by going, and you guys, there are so many other different kinds. Um, I found lists of anywhere from 15 to 20 different types of cognitive distortions. Um, but these were the ones that I picked out to talk to you about that I think are, I see very frequently within the survivor community. And I hope that by looking at these, it will help you to identify cognitive distortions, to understand them better and identify them in your own life. Miss Athena, before I go on to ways to cope and change, do you have any questions that are coming in from our um, esteemed I, colleagues? <laughs> they're so wonderful. We're, we, I, I had some light bulb moments happen here. Um, Phoenix realized that the reason that she believed that no one cared about her writing is because someone told her that. So someone told her, no one cares about your writing. And... Yeah. So she adopted that as her own belief. And so she has a deep fear of sharing her writing because she thinks no one is going to care. Right. So she was wrong, wrong, wrong. And we love your writing and we're excited about it. And Oh, so Tracy says, my abuser would take my dog so that I would go there. I can't let go of thinking that I put myself in the situation. Oh, that you're to blame. Yes. Oh, yeah. goodness, Tracy. You're not to blame, Tracy. You are not to blame. And then let me see here. You're not to blame. Um, I have one more. Uh, Kalisha says, when I'm at my parents, it's a revolving door of distortions, always on edge and trying to keep boundaries. E oh, yeah. yeah. I have a heart. I forget who said it, but you think you're so enlightened to go spend a week with your family. <laughs> it's so hard because you guys, all families are dysfunctional. There's no family out there that's perfect. Everyone has their issues. Um, some of us have a full subscription, but everybody's got issues. So, yep. um, <laughs> I mean, Kalisha, you are not alone. Seriously. No. Oh, yeah, no. you are not alone. Um, and let me, let me see here. Um, oh, got a little side talk here. Uh, Jack says he hears a little voice all the time um, that says no one cares about his writing. He heard that voice for 11 years. Um, and that's not a true voice, Jack. We do care about your writing. We love your writing. Um, that's a fun house mirror. Yep. Oh, that's um, not a fun one. Oh, and Sarah says she struggles with the shoulds. Yeah. Oh, me yeah. too. Me too. I think that too. is so common, and it feels so lousy. Um, yeah, and August says, this is my life. People can be forgiven, but I can't forgive myself. Ah, I struggle with that for so the long. The double standard. Yes. yes. You know, and gosh, you guys, grace, mercy, and compassion. Grace, mercy, and compassion. And I know that those are often used within um, religious communities, and they, and they do have a very divine meaning behind them within the context. But anybody, no matter your belief system, you could give someone grace, mercy, and compassion. Okay? Because grace is kindness, um, even when you're struggling. And mercy is, okay, things may not be going exactly well. I love you. Um, you know, don't worry about it. Let's just move on. Um, and compassion, of course, is that that desire to love and care for someone when they're struggling. So we all need grace, mercy, and compassion, and we need to extend one another. Grace, mercy, and compassion. Let's talk about ways to cope with and change cognitive distortions. And the first one is learn to recognize your cognitive distortions. Write them out if you think it would help. Sit down and make a list. Um, these are the cognitive distortions that I recognize that I have. Um, and again, it's that first step in what Athena and I talk about when we talk about see it, stop it, change it. You can't change it if you don't see it. And so that first step when people were talking in chat this morning, this is huge. How do I change this? Okay, the first thing is look for it. Like I tell my clients, put on your anthropology hat and go out and just observe. 
observe your head, observe your behaviors, and you will see them. Um, and if you have safe people in your life, ask them to help you identify them. Um, if it would help you trace the origins of your cognitive distortions so you know where they came from and how you learned them, um, it can be very beneficial for some of us to know how and where we learn things. So many survivors that I work with, that is a critical thing for them. They want the pieces to the puzzle to fit together. They want to know where did that come from? Why do I do that? And it's okay. It's okay for you to, to want to know those things. Um, some things we're not always going to know and we're going to have to just let that go and it's hard as heck. But it's okay to trace them back and figure out, oh, okay, I get it. That's where I learned that. Now I understand. Um, develop a list of healthy thoughts and beliefs. This is so important because stopping cognitive distortions is only half or a third of the equation, okay? So you see them, you stop them, you change them. If you just stop the negative cognitive distortions, you have to have something positive to put in there. And something that I have learned, um, and, and just in the last year in my work with survivors, this has become more prevalent in what I see and how I perceive things to go. Sometimes, if we can just start putting the positive out there and strengthening it, eventually it becomes so strong that it drowns out the negative. We don't have to work at just chipping away at the negative and beating it up and removing it. Sometimes the best thing to do is build up your good pile, like Athena and I talk about. It's build up your healthy thoughts and beliefs. And eventually, they will become so strong that they will simply outgrow or, you know, they'll throw a shadow over the um, unhealthy cognitive distortions. Well, there are no healthy cognitive distortions. The unhealthy thinking and beliefs to the point that they're just a speck. And um, you're not tempted at all to go back to them. You don't see them anymore. They're in the past. They're in your rearview mirror. Hey, Bobby. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. um, Grace Hope um, says, you're bad, so you're dirty, so you have to get clean inside and out. I still believe that. And I told her that sounds a lot like my intrusive thoughts. Yes, that to me seems like a cognitive distortion that became a core belief that now circles through your head as an intrusive thought. Boom. Just like that. Right. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so someone put that horror house mirror in front of you and said, this is you. And that image has stuck in your head. And now it circles. Tracy wants to know, how do you change them when the feelings don't match the words? My response is, it takes time. It does. And you know what? Keep saying those things and your feelings will catch up. And enlist the help of your safe people. Join, commun join in community with other people. And, you know, we have Facebook support groups. Go in there and say, you know what, you guys, I am just struggling today to believe anything positive about myself. All I can think of is everything I touch turns to dirt. I guarantee you that will, people will come in there and say, wait a minute, that's not true. Here's an example of how I see that not true. This is the good thing you've done in my life. You remember when you did this last week? That was so amazing and awesome. Um, so sometimes we just have to start piling on the good talk and eventually our feelings will catch up to that truth. But feelings wow, you guys, they're just so powerful. Emotions are so powerful. And they are not, it's, it's actually easier to change our thinking than it is to change our emotions. But emotions follow thoughts. So keep thinking the good, th the good thoughts and eventually the emotions will catch up.
I promise. Um, be aware that leaving cognitive distortions behind may initially be frightening as we may have a false belief that they kept us safe as a child or that rejecting them is disloyal to our family or our abusers. Okay, um, amazing example of this. Um, when I was first going into therapy, I thought I was unlovable. But I was resistant. I was frightened to change that, st that statement into I am lovable. Because you know what happens when you think you're lovable? Then you're at risk of being rejected. If you go out and you present yourself to the world as lovable, and someone then someone can treat you badly but if you go out to the world and you say hello everyone here I am I'm unlovable guess what you're never hurt and you're never disappointed because people always treat you when people treat you badly you're like okay that person treated me badly because I'm unlovable but when you go out there and you say here I am folks I'm lovable then when someone treats you badly it hurts so sometimes we use those cognitive distortions to protect and to cope. And so letting go of them can be frightening. And letting go of them can be frightening even when we don't use them to cope because it's like swimming in a whole different ocean. And hey, Bobby. Need, uh -huh. Remember that time that I told you that someone during chat said that I was um, beautiful or gorgeous or something. They said that I was beautiful on the inside and out. And I said that it shocked me and I felt like I needed to go hide and I almost peed myself. <laughs> yes. Remember? And I'm right. serious. Like, I had like a physical response to someone's compliment like that. It just, it scared me. Or it yeah. just, it, because it was just terrifying. So Grace Hope says, when somebody says something nice to me, it makes me physically sick and I throw up. And I'm letting her know I struggle too with that because if anybody, Grace, I hope this helps you because this is, this is the only way I can wrap my head around this. And Bobby, I want you to chime in. When we were little and if someone paid us a compliment, we were being groomed for abuse. Right. It was usually a, oh, you're beautiful. A precursor. Come here. Come here. Come here. Let me touch your hair. Oh, it's so pretty. Oh, you're so pretty. Oh, let me feel that dress. Oh, look at the hem of that dress. Oh, that's so gorgeous. Oh, you have such beautiful knees. And it just, you know, goes from there. Of course. That was our that was set up. It's a you precursor. Know? It's it a precursor. precursor. We always wondered if someone says something nice to us, an automatic thought is, what do they want? Yep. What are they setting me up for? Yep. Uh, and that's a cognitive distortion. When someone says something nice to me, it's because they want something from me. That's a cognitive they, they distortion. Want to, they want to exploit me. They want to set me up and exploit me in some way. Right. Yep. Um, and so, yes, shifting your thinking and learning healthy ways of thinking can be very frightening. So don't beat yourself up if you feel frightened. Don't beat yourself up if you feel guilty for abandoning the unhealthy thought of your childhood and feeling disloyal to your family. It's part of the process, and there's nothing wrong with you, and you are doing nothing wrong. And this last one, you know what, you guys, just be patient and compassionate with yourself as you go through this process. It's hard. It isn't an overnight process, but it is possible. And practice is an essential part of the process, okay? It's like we never, ever flexed the muscle of healthy thinking. And so, of course, when we first try using it, we're not going to be able to pick up very many healthy thoughts. We just don't have the muscle power. So we have to practice. And eventually, we'll be able to pick up more and pick up more and pick up more and pick up more. And as we often tell y'all, a great place to practice healthy behaviors is in safe community because you will have people who will say, whoa, way to go. They will recognize how incredible what you have done is. They'll recognize your growth, even in baby steps. Like 
when you think you've made no progress whatsoever, someone in your state community will come along and say, oh my goodness, I noticed that that that's a huge that was a huge area of growth for you previously and look here you are you're having success in this area like I'm celebrating that win with you right now and you kind of at first you're kind of like well wait a second are what do they want why are they being wait wait yes I I see what they're saying now okay I I am doing pretty good. I'm doing a little bit better. It just takes time. It takes time. And, it, and like Bobby said, it's a muscle that you have to exercise. Practice, practice, practice. Safe community, safe community, safe community. We're going to always preach that because it's true. True healing. Powerful. Happens. Yes, true healing happens in safe community. I mean, Oh my goodness, it's life changing. You you can ask anyone that's here watching. We still have dozens of people that are watching live right now. Over a dozen people that are still live, even though we're running long. Um, and you guys, safe community is life changing, and it is just it's an honor to be a part of someone else's growth and recovery, and it's a and it's a privilege and a blessing to have them be involved in yours and to recognize things about you that you don't recognize yourself. So um, I hope this broadcast has been helpful for you. I believe we've answered everyone's questions on our live Q&A Monday on the topic of cognitive distortions. Um, August says, I'm not giving up. Um, and then, um, gosh, we just have some, you guys are so amazing. You guys, you're not alone. All these things that you're sharing, you're not alone. We've all thought these same thoughts are similar, and it's so great to be healing alongside you guys. So we're going to be transitioning this portion of our broadcast out of our educational content of our online interactive talk show. And we're going to transition into how you can get plugged into safe community with all of us and other amazing survivors that have lived through what you live through. There's no catch. There's nothing for sale here. It's free. Like we just are blessed to be with you and we want to invite you to heal in safe community because you deserve to heal in safe community. So Bobby's going to do a screen share right now. I am. Yes. It looks beautiful. Um, it's a tiny bit small, but it is beautiful. Okay. I'll make it bigger. Be Maybe it's because my, I'm old. I'm oh, old that, too. that looks awesome. I can see it better now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we have um, multiple free resources for all of you. And one of the most powerful ones are our Twitter chats. You can come and participate in them anytime you like. They're free, no cost. You just have to have a Twitter account. Um, and you can start one, use a fake name. Um, that's just fine. And the first one is Monday. And the hashtag for that is CSAQT, Child Sexual Abuse Question Time. That is at 10 o'clock Pacific Time in the U.S., 6 o'clock in the U.K. And then the second one is this one that is taking place right now, which is a combination video Twitter chat. The hashtag is no more shame. It's at six o'clock on Monday evenings on Pacific Coast. That's nine o'clock on the East Coast and Tuesday at two o'clock in the morning for our UK fans. Um, Tuesday evening is the third and final Twitter chat of the week. And that is at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 o'clock Eastern, Wednesdays at 2 o'clock in the morning for the UK. And the hashtag is sex abuse chat. If you want to watch us, you want to watch the live broadcast and participate in the Twitter streams over on the right side of the page, you will see the um, link that you can use, bit.ly forward slash trauma recover you, the capitals do matter. Um, and again, every Monday night at six o'clock uh, Pacific time or Tuesdays at two o'clock in the morning. If you would like to join one of our Facebook support groups, they're secret, they're private, no one will even know that you're in them. In fact, if you were to go to Facebook and search for them, they wouldn't show up in a search. They're not available to the public. They're only available to people that Athena and I grant access, and Athena and I are the only ones that can do it. 
Um, and there's an easy four-step process, and this works the best. Um, the first thing to do is to like the Trauma Recovery University Facebook page, then send Athena and I both friend requests. Um, sometimes one of us can get back to you sooner than the other, so send one to both of us. Yeah. <laughs> and then we will accept those um, unless they're, you know, you just opened the Facebook account yesterday and there's no information or even a picture, then we're going to ask you a little bit about who you are before we accept your friend request. And then once we've accepted it, but once we've accepted, not before, send us a message saying, I'd like to heal and safe community. I'd like to join your support group for sexual abuse survivors. Um, and if we know you already, say you've been participating in our Twitter chats, we've interacted with you on Twitter or Facebook, um, then we will welcome you into one of our support groups. If we don't know you, we'll ask you some questions because the safety and security of the people in our support groups is so important to us. Predators try to get in and we do everything in our power to keep them out. So if we ask you some questions, please don't be offended. We just have to go through a bit of a screening process to make sure that we're letting in safe people. Um, and then we'll add you to one of the groups. We'll post an introduction to the rest of the members, and then you will be able to experience um, the magic that is healing in safe community. Yes. Da, 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 da. Okay. One more slide. And we have we have the most awesome community, Bobby. I just have to tell you. I know I always say that, but everybody is just supporting one another so much. Um, Jack was sharing that um, yes, safe community is life changing. I am living it, um, and um, Jack actually had to tell his abuser and another family member to please stop touching my hair without asking. That is a very healthy boundary, Jack, and that is terrifying to uh, establish that healthy boundary if it's not something that you grew up with. So way to yeah. go. We're literally like celebrating and throwing confetti with you because that's huge, huge. It is, especially when there's someone who, who was your abuser. Oh my gosh! Yeah, I had to. Saying, I had to tell my dad. I remember. Remember, Bobby? I told you yeah. I had to tell my tell my dad. Dad, when I'm driving and you reach across and grab my knee and start tickling me while I'm driving and the car starts swerving into oncoming traffic, that's not smart. I need you to stop touching me without asking. It's very, very, very um, inappropriate. I need you to yeah. stop doing that. And he kept doing it. You guys, I had to pull the car over. Oh, Sorry. <laughs> Um, these are ways that you can connect with Athena and I via email. We ask that you be patient with us as it may take us some time to get back to you. Um, you can reach me at bobbylparish at gmail.com. Athena is at athenamobergspeaking at gmail.com. And then we have our joint email, which is nomoreshameproject at gmail.com. We would love to connect with you on Twitter, interact with you on Twitter. I am Bobby L. Parrish. Athena is Athena Moberg. And then we have the Trauma Recovery University Twitter account, which is Trauma Recovery U. And on that one, capitals don't matter. Um, we would love to connect with you on Facebook. We have the business page for Trauma Recovery University. My business page is Bobby Parrish Coaching and Consulting. Athena's business page is Athena Moberg Speaking. My personal page is Bobby Parrish, and Athena's personal page is Dawn Athena Moberg. You can find our videos 24-7 on YouTube, Trauma Recovery University, um, on Roku TV, Trauma Recovery University, and on Google Plus under Trauma Recovery University. And you can binge watch for, like, uh, let's see, 24 hours, like four straight days without taking a break. Although we don't recommend you do that. No, we don't want you to, we don't want you to watch for four whole days straight. I mean, 
if you have four days of self-care and this is a form of self-care for you because you're in like that like section of your recovery when you're looking for information and you're discovering and you're taking back your power and knowledge is power and you're gaining knowledge then great but man make sure you're eating and sleeping and drinking and like just make sure <laughs> make sure you're taking care of yourself but we That's do right. we just want you to know that we do provide as many uh, resources for you as possible we are we're doing our very best in 2016 to make this broadcast available in as many mediums as possible so we have written of course with the downloadable PDF resources and in our show notes everything is written out like steps on how to get connected and then if you look at the transcript it's the words all the words that we that we spoke and then we're going audio like iTunes Stitcher, Spreaker, SoundCloud, iHeartRadio, all that and then obviously video visual through Roku TV and YouTube and we're doing many of these things separately and then written of course again the Twitter chats um, but we're getting we're trying to make this element of your recovery journey available in as many mediums as possible because different people receive support in different ways so for some people they're not very Twitter savvy and they get super triggered because they feel very inadequate and lost in the Twitter verse but for some people, they love Twitter because it's just 140 characters. It's brief. It's 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 quick. You know, they they love it. And then video is not like something that they love because it's just too in living color for them. So, um, if you have some suggestions for us on how we can make ourselves available to you and somehow support you, let us know. We're doing our very best in 2016 to make it available in as many mediums as possible. But um, but yeah, we we would just we we love connecting with you guys and providing these resources for you. So, um, Bobby, what am I forgetting? What am I um, what am I leaving out before we say aloha to everyone? I can't think of anything. Um, and if we forgot something, we'll tweet it or Facebook it. And oh, I know, we'll be back next week, next Monday. We're going to be talking about self harming. Ooh, um, yes, so that's a big one. And it was suggested by several of our community members that we do a broadcast on self-harm. So, yes. And then I have another suggestion from two of our community members, Laura and Jenny, talking about what does a safe and healthy relationship actually look like. And I have an example. I have a letter that was written. I have uh, specific questions. And we're going to be covering that in the weeks to come as well, maybe after we I do self-harm. I love that. I love yes. that. So what let's does a follow yeah. Right. Let's we'll follow, follow up self-harm with something really positive. Yes. What does the healthy relationship look like in drastic contrast to the unhealthy or abusive relationship or dysfunctional relationships that perhaps we came out of, out of childhood, and how do we cultivate healthy relationships in our adulthood? Um, there were several people that were triggered tonight. Phoenix, you're triggered. I'm so sorry, honey. Please don't be triggered. We love you, bestie. We love you, beautifuls, and we're grateful for you. Um, Bobby and I consider this such a privilege. We look forward to Mondays so much. We have a lot going on in our lives outside of this broadcast. We have some health concerns. We have some business decisions that we're making. We have software. We have technology stuff. We have a lot going on. We both work jobs, and we have just stuff going on, family things, stuff. But this is a highlight of our week. And so thank you for being such an integral part of our recovery journey. And we consider it a privilege to be a part of yours. So any, any, um, anything that you want to say, Bobby, before we say goodbye? Just that we're so honored that you're here and you'd spend time with us. And we hope that um, tonight has been helpful to you and you'll come back. We want to see you again. Yeah. We'd love to see you again. If this video was helpful for you, please hit the like button. And if you feel like it would help somebody, share it with one of your friends. Um, but the likes really help. And um, we can continue making more videos, the, obviously, the more subscribers. So subscribe to our channel if you're not already a subscriber. Uh, we have about 800 subscribers right now. And we're getting so close to 1,000. I'm so excited. Um, and we're in 57 countries officially per our YouTube analytics. So um, 
so exciting. Seriously, you guys. So thank you so much. I'm Athena Moberg, and this is Bobby Parrish, and we love bringing you everything you need for healthy, informed trauma recovery. We'll see you next week on the topic of self-harm. Aloha, everyone.